inch by inch and row by row I'm gonna make this garden go All it takes is a rake and a hoe and a piece of fertile ground Good morning! So I'm standing outside the food pantry at Calvary and most of you, your parents probably, have received a letter which invites us all to participate in the Lenten practice of growing seeds and these are pollinating flowers, which will be added after Easter, when the weather gets nice, to our pollinator garden, which will be near our community garden over there on the other side of the labyrinth. So today, just to show you what to do in case you're like me, you live in an apartment or a place where you don't have your own dirt, you can come to Calvary to get some dirt to put in your peat cups to start your flowers. So, right outside on the porch of the pantry, we have a wheelbarrow. And we have some baggies so that you don't get dirt all over your car. And you can just put about one scoop of dirt into your bag. And then over here, we have two cups. And you can take them home to plant your flower. Now we're going to go inside and show you how to do that. So now here we are in the Godly Playroom, and what I'd like to do is just demonstrate putting together our project for Lent. You know, during Lent, sometimes we take things on or we give things up. So what we're doing is taking on a practice of caring for a new plant. And the great thing is, there's kind of a goal for this little plant, besides decorating our own little gardens, we're going to hopefully have a successful blossom that we can plant here at Calvary. And all the flowers that have been chosen for this project and sent to everybody who goes to church here are called pollinators. And that's because they attract butterflies and bumblebees and other insects that end up pollinating naturally the rest of the garden. So those flowers include zinnias, sunflowers, and marigolds, I believe are the ones that we purchased. And there's one also called Echin Echinacea. Somebody can probably tell me how to pronounce it better next time they come into the church, but it's a nice lavender color. This one is a zinnia, and it says in the back that we should pour our seeds into about a quarter inch of soil. So I'm going to just put them right on top and then add soil on top. And by the way, there's more seeds that you need for this one little cup, so you can make additional cups that you can plant in your own home. I never knew how many sunflowers there were. This one is a special one that I just thought was so adorable. It looks like if you put two googly eyes, on it, googly eyes on it, you'd have a little puppet. But anyway, it's called a dwarf teddy bear sunflower. So I'll put that one in the other cup. And this one says about one inch of soil. So I'm gonna put them down a little further in my cup of dirt. And by the way, this peat cup is meant to be planted in the ground when we bring it back to Calvary after Easter. I was told probably sometime around Mother's Day. So that way, this peat cup really becomes part of the soil. It's possible, especially with the sunflowers, that you need to transfer your plants to another cup. I have one just in case, especially for the sunflower, because even in just a month and a half, you might have quite a strong stem flower, so it would need more support around it. Well, we'll just see how it goes, make changes as we have to. Oh yes, it's always a good idea to keep Either, you know, either label a little stick and put it in the flower, or you could just keep the original packet and start by just watering 
Wow. Or according to the directions on each packet. You don't have to read your own to see how often, once or twice a day. So let us say a prayer over our project so that we might all be united and connected by our mutual practice this Lent. Let us pray. Dear Lord, on this Ash Wednesday, as we remember your 40 days in the wilderness, please help us to first and foremost connect with you, understanding your journey before you started your call to ministry as a teacher, preacher, and someone to help us to learn how to live and how to love according to your will in your creation. And we'd like to take on a practice as we remember you, Lord, of taking care of the plants that we've been given by Calvary. This will help us to learn about dying to ourselves and rising to new life after Easter. And it will also connect us to all the other people here. We have such a social church, Lord. Right now we cannot meet together, but this is one really great way to connect with each other until we can meet and worship and socially gather again. So please bless all these flowers so that we come back sometime after Easter and plant them together in our community garden. Thank you, Lord, for all our blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, now let's have, um, we're going to have a lesson about the Transfiguration. So here we are using our desert box to tell the story of the Transfiguration. In the Gospel of Mark, right before this story, Jesus is teaching his disciples. And he says to them, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, you are blessed, Peter, for God has shown you who I am. And then Jesus said, but I need to tell you something that might be hard for you to understand. I must go up to Jerusalem for Passover and I will be killed, but on the third day, I will become alive again. And this, of course, was very hard for the disciples to understand. Jesus taught them for six more days, and then he said to Peter, James, and John, I'd like you to come with me to the mountain so we can talk about God. So let's show Jesus and Peter and James and John on a long hike. The Bible says they either were going up to Mount um, Hermon or another nearby mountain, Mount Tabor. It's not really clear, but it could have been one or the other based on where Galilee is. And they probably didn't climb all the way to the top. They probably came to one of the slopes because that would have been a very long hike into very cold weather. But there certainly are a number of events that happen in the Bible on mountains and they're all very special. So Jesus went up a little bit by himself to pray. And as he was praying and talking to God, Peter, James, and John saw that Jesus was transfigured. So during this special, what we call a numinous moment, they saw Jesus in a way that looked very holy and maybe a glimpse of what he would be like in his eternal state in heaven. And so his, his clothes became dazzling white. And then in addition, um, I'll just take two figures from here. Elijah and Moses were appear, appeared next to him. And you might wonder, who are Elijah and Moses? Well, Elijah was a prophet of the Old Testament. He was a great prophet who taught many other prophets. And he worked miracles. And he was also predicted by another prophet named Malachi that he would be present at the coming of a new age. 
So it's significant, and that means it's important that he showed up right now because Jesus, as we said earlier, is on his way to the cross, and that's the beginning of a new age in our uh, religion that we celebrate. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And then, of course, Moses. I bet you could tell me about Moses. Moses climbed Mount Sinai and was given the Ten Commandments, and we call them in our lesson the Ten Best Ways to Live. He's also considered, besides Jesus, the closest to God in the whole Bible of all the people. And if you read all about Moses in the Old Testament, you'll see why. He was often talking to God about many, many things. And that's a good example for us in prayer. Well, all of a sudden, all of this special kind of stuff disappeared. Jesus reappeared to be, you know, himself as a regular person again. Moses and Elijah disappeared, the vision disappeared. And then a voice was heard, it was the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And so at first Peter said, maybe we should make a memorial here so we can always remember what happened. But on the way down the mountain, Jesus said, you know, it's enough that you just remember in your heart what happened and that you pray about it sometimes and let it remind you whenever you're scared or you don't know what to do that God is with us all in a special way and we don't always see it but God's with us that way all the time and let it be a comfort to you in the coming days because pretty soon things are going to get really, really difficult for me and I need you to be strong. So, not really understanding, but understanding more than they did before, James, John, and Peter shared with the other disciples how to be strong and how to remember always to keep Jesus and his eternal state in our hearts so that we can be more like him day to day and we can always remember we will be with him forever. So that's the story of the transfiguration. So what we're about to do is called Bearing the Alleluias, and you can see on this banner we have Christ is risen, Alleluia, Alleluia, which is what we say at Easter time. And we've got two little flowers, so maybe by that time we'll have some flowers grown too. Um, and so Bearing the Alleluias is a practice in the Episcopal Church because during Lent we don't say Alleluia during the liturgy because it's a celebratory thing and this is a more somber time in the church. So I'm about to wrap it up and put it in a tube, and then we'll go outside and bury it. And then on Easter morning, really early in the morning, we'll unbury it and take it back out because it's time to say Alleluia again.
right, so now buried our hallelujahs, and you know where they are because you're watching this video. So when you're on the grounds next, you can take a little peek at where we buried them. And we'll see you next time when we come to unbury them at Easter. Inch by inch and row by row, someone bless these seeds I sow. Someone warm them from below till the rains come tumbling down. <laughs>